So, so remember that the response rate, the number of people who answer your um, survey uh, over the number of people you sent the survey to is your response rate. And the higher the response rate, the higher the proportion of, of the people you sent the survey to um, that respond, the more you can trust your results. So it's really important to have ways um, to improve that response rate. And this is a known way to, imp to improve the response rate. It's called uh, having multiple contacts. Um, and four is considered the minimum. I've seen five, I've seen six. Uh, so just so you know, typically you're asked to send a pre-notice letter or uh, something like that that informs the person that they've been selected out of you know this population to take the survey and that their response the survey is about XYZ and their response is greatly uh, needed. Um, then the second contact typically is actually mailing the survey or dropping it off or um, or sending it via email with the link. The third contact is typically a thank you note for those who have taken the survey, and but then a reminder to those who haven't taken the survey to please take it. The fourth contact usually um, is through certified mail or some more sternly worded email or something like that that says, please take your survey, this is really important for our research, um, and here's the survey again. And then the final contact is a thank you. Now I've modified this um, to suit how I distribute surveys and it's been very successful. So I do um, the, this last one that's going around, the students actually go to the particular address and they knock on the door and if someone answers they say, Hi, uh, we're conducting a survey of XYZ. Uh, here's the survey. Please answer if you have time. There's an envelope in there to send the survey back free of charge, or I can wait for here for you to take it. So basically, it's kind of, there's no pre-notice, um, but you've got that contact, that foot in the door, where you're there and people, you know, it's almost like a social contract. If the person isn't there, we leave the survey in a pl clear plastic bag on the doorknob of the door with all the instructions you saw and the nice picture to really in incentivize people to take that survey. Then we wait a week. After a week, the participants get a postcard. Um, and so I'll, uh, I'll pass around these postcards. And in the front just says thank you for participating and then in the back you know it says if you already if you've already completed thank you but if you haven't we really need your response. <laughs> Two weeks later we mail another survey a whole other survey with another envelope that's stamped for return and a week after that we send the final postcard that says this is the last contact you'll have from us please take, um, you know, we are hoping to summarize, begin summarizing data later this month. We still hope to receive your response to ensure accurate results. This is the last time we will contact you about filling out our survey. We're basically kind of pulling at heartstrings, like, but being a little bit more, um, see, you know, have, have a more stern approach to try and get them to fill out this survey. Um, Whenever you do, whenever you make a survey, you always want to pretest it and pilot it. The pretest is basically doing a, a version of a focus group where you, you put together everything and you bring people in and you ask them to take the survey out loud. So they have to read the question, answer it, and then say out loud, the whole thing out loud, why did they answer the way they answered? And typically, that saves you a ton of time later because it uncovers uh, ways that people are misinterpreting your questions or misunderstandings and so it gives you a chance to rework the questions, rework the order before everything goes out um, to, the, to your population. So the pretest is invaluable um, on so many levels yet oftentimes it's skipped. 
Um, the pilot is where you test the whole approach. So, you know, knocking on people's doors, sending on a different population. So it's like a tiny little uh, subset of your survey that you do just to check you've got all the mechanics, just to check you've got the right postage on the envelopes or things like that. And again, it saves you a lot of time um, at the end. So to increase the response rate, you really need to use those multiple contacts. You need to develop a respondent-friendly survey, pretty to look at, you know, colors if you can, lots of spacing. You need to personalize the correspondence. So a few years ago, we were doing a survey and it was different neighborhoods in Cincinnati and the neighborhoods have names. And so in each of the correspondence, we would say, dear resident of such and such neighborhood. And yeah, that takes more time to print the associated postcards and to keep track of which postcards goes to which address, but it increases response rate. And if you have their real name, then you should put that. Dear Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. Again, personalizing that correspondence really matters. Uh, I've already said this, if you can deliver it personally, you'll increase response rate. Um, if you can, if you have the money to include a stamped return envelope for a mail survey, that'll tremendously um, increase response rate. Uh, if people have to pay for the postage, they're unlikely to send it back. And then typically you include a small token of appreciation. So most of our surveys had a dollar bill, a US dollar bill. In the US that doesn't even buy a cup of coffee, but it's a little social contract that people are like, ugh, I've got this dollar bill, they gave me this dollar bill, I really feel like I should fill out this survey. Um, and it works, it works every time, well most of the time. Um, so, uh, but just to say you, ha you also, you have to keep track of that response rate. Here's a graph, so on the x-axis you have time um, during which um, these researchers we're collecting um, responses. And on the y-axis, you have response rate. This was an email survey. Well, it's a mixed mode, but mainly email. So the first email went out, you know, on March 30th, and they get like an 8% response rate. Um, and no, no, no. First they had a, a postal invite and a link to a website to take the survey. So they mailed something to people and they had a link to a web-based survey. And so you see that at, um, two days later, after this uh, was set out, they had an 8% response rate. Then they also happened to have the email of everybody, which isn't always the case. But they sent out this email um, saying, please take this survey, here's the link again, and notice they climb up to 50% response rate. Um, then they send another email reminder, 63% response rate. Then they send a paper questionnaire to the people who still haven't replied. So mail them a paper copy. And they go up to, and, well, essentially they end up with a 77% response rate. I have never had a response rate that high. The highest I've ever had was 60, 67, and I was pretty proud of it. You'll see people with 20% response rates. You cannot, like, what if those 80% of people who didn't reply had fundamentally different views than everybody else? But yet you're, you're saying that those 20% are representative of the whole. You can't make that assumption. I can't really at 70% either, but I'm more confident in it than if I had 20, uh-oh, uh, need power. Uh -oh. oh, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, and so that gets us to uh, the survey errors. So if you write questions that are ambiguous, like you didn't follow, you know, um, the, 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 you know, if you've got double-barreled questions, or your question is too specific or not specific enough, or the order of questions is not logical, etc., 
um, you're gonna have measurement error. Like, yeah, you'll have some quantification of whatever you're trying to measure, but it will have bias in it because of the way you uh, wrote those questions or designed the instrument. If your instrument is too long, or if you've somehow managed to alienate part of the population that you're trying to survey, and those people aren't responding, or if it's such a small font that older people or people who have poor eyesight can't read it, again, that would be a non-response bias. Like people aren't responding, and it's a certain subset of your population. Um, there's also sampling error, which I'm just, you guys will, ha you all will have the slides, um, but, and you can calculate how large your sample needs to be using those equations, but there is this nifty little tool, that, that um, table, that gives you the answer, so you don't have to plug things in, but basically, um, Basically, for a different population size, it tells you how many completed surveys you would need in order to trust your results. Um, and notice that it, like, okay, so Butler County, for example, or, well, let's do, let, let's say I'm doing my university and it has 10,000 students. It has more than that, but. Um, I would need 95 completed surveys in order to have a 10% confidence interval around, uh, you know, the, the, the mean of those answers. Uh, so notice that it's quite a lot of uh, answers needed and it goes up for, the, for um, how certain you want to be about these values. Um, so for this summer, we actually reached that, um, but it's not always possible, and that's okay, but then you just have to uh, write in your limitations, you know, that you, um, you subset a, a much smaller, um, s you had a much smaller sample size than would be required for, for um, these calculations. And we can go over that in detail if you're interested. It's really hard to achieve, except if you have huge populations. So if you're doing a survey at the level of a country, for example, notice that the values don't very much, very much, um, they do not differ very much from you know doing a survey of a population of 10,000 people and that's that's just how statistics work um, so you're actually it's easier to do a survey for a larger population than it is a smaller population and to trust the results um, survey design notice that there's certain um, conventions so usually if you're picking one thing, especially in online surveys, if, if people need to pick one item, it's usually a box choice. If they're gonna pick, mul if they're allowed to pick multiple, check all that apply, it's usually a round choice. And you do want, if, even if you don't use those symbols, you do want different symbols for if they're only gonna pick one or if they're gonna pick multiple choices, yes. I think it's the other way around. Well, there it's could be logical. different. Normally they use boxes, but if it's round, it's a single. There may be different it, conventions culturally, but what you do it what you do want is you want to keep it consistent. So if you pick boxes for check all that apply throughout your survey, it should be boxes. And, it, and then you should have a different symbols for when you pick check only one. So the, the symbol itself doesn't matter, it's the difference that really, you know, it's the different symbols that really help people keep track of when they can pick one and when they can pick more than one. Uh, here's an example of a visual preference survey. Well, these are the results. But in the visual preference surveys, and this would be a neat way to do um, the choice, um, the choice 
uh, methodology for evaluating. They have different houses and they have this picture. In this case, they're asking for desirability, not value. But they basically, you know, had a, a uh, they asked for how desirable in a scale of, I don't remember what the scale was, but how desirable is this look versus that look versus that look versus that look. Um, although I think some were for houses and some for, were for streetscapes. Um, and then they, they report the mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, standard error, and uh, et cetera. But visual preference surveys um, can be pretty um, obviously they're better in color, uh, but, but people, people like the pretty pictures. <laughs> so if you have, if you have the chance to do something like that and it fits your goals, it, it can work real well. If your institution has a review board for uh, human subject research, and every institution in the U.S. does, uh, you have to clear your questions and your approach, um, i.e., how are you selecting the population, why, are, chil are you ever going to be asking questions of children, how sensitive are the questions, any kind of medical history, things like that. Would ha th those, all those questions have to clear the review board before you can even contact your first human subject. So I do not know if, if your respective countries and universities um, have such a thing, but you need to check. Uh, because if they do, and you don't um, get approval beforehand, you could be in trouble. Um, and if you're also trying to publish your survey results, um, oftentimes you will be asked by the reviewers or the editor, you know, was your protocol approved by your institutional review board? And what's the, each, at our school, each um, survey gets an ID number and I report that in, um, in, the, in the paper. Um, so that's something you all have to check with your respective countries and, and institutions, but it's something to be um, aware of. Yeah, Elizabeth?